am back with my guest today, Kelly Vaughn. Kelly, we have never met before, right? Nope. This is true. And as is my usual practice, I ask my guests <laughs> where they are dialing in from and to tell us something about their neck of the woods. Maybe you have a point of interest. I could give you a moment because I didn't forewarn you. Sure. I live in a town called Fuquay, Verena, North Carolina. It is about a half an hour outside of Raleigh. And it's um, we are surrounded by a lot of farmland and cows and horses and tobacco in Can my spell that? in my neighborhood. Fuquay, F U Q U A Y, V A R I N A. Oh, Two towns. So sorry for the town of Fuquay and the town of Verena. They merged back in the seventies. I feel sorry for any kids <laughs> in that neighborhood who have to write <laughs> down. Where yes. They- Whoa. <laughs> That's a mouthful. Okay, so usually I don't know the person and I know very little about them. And we just sort of have like an interesting chat and I hope that will be the case today. Sure. Um, you came to my attention because of an article written by Dr. Susan Strawn, who, by the way, I just interviewed her video oh, nice. is not yet up on my channel, but in my conversation with her, your name came up. So I was oh, wondering okay. if your ears were ringing. The wow. Other day. <laughs> wow, that's awesome. I love her work. <laughs> well, she's written articles about Virginia Woods Bellamy, who is mm-hmm. going to be, I think, the main topic of our dialogue today. I'm going to let you introduce who Virginia Woods Bellamy was and what her number knitting book is all about and then we'll go from there sure sure well virginia this is her book number knitting it was published in 1952 and it only had one print run of 5000 copies and before she wrote this she and after she wrote this she was a poet primarily and so she had a lot of published works of her poetry she wrote children's operettas she had um after she passed a book of her poems was published and so there was this this segment of her life where in addition to the poetry she did knitting and but that wasn't like her primary thing you know like we've all probably heard of Elizabeth Zimmerman and we're very familiar with Elizabeth and we love her work and I think one of the reasons that we're so familiar with her is that was like the majority of her publishing for decades she made her whole career off of that but Virginia in her book she just she had a a handful of pamphlets that she did in Women's Home Companion and McCall's Needlework and Crafts. And then she did her book. And that was it. Like she, she didn't continue doing like knitting publishing. I think from my research, she did some, um, she did a correspondence course and she did some like, you know, she had a home studio where she taught some classes and that sort of thing. But like, as far as her publishing work, the knitting ended, the knitting publishing ended in with that book. And so once the generation of knitters that, you know, that were around when this book was published, once those people kind of phased out of the scene, so did the majority of the knowledge of this book. And um, I think that's why it almost got lost to obscurity. And the, the only reason I know about it is because back when I was in college, I, uh, I had a subscription to Knitters Magazine, and there was one article in there written by Meg Swanson, who was Elizabeth Zimmerman's daughter. And Meg mentioned, sort of as a sidebar, oh, by the way, the garter stitch, it, it was, um, the original modular garter stitch was based on a patented knitting method by Virginia Woods Bellamy, and it was called Never Knitting. And that was it. <laughs> and so I checked the book out from the university library, and this was gosh, this was like 25 years ago. I checked it out from the library and I, you know, I flipped through it and I, I extracted some, you know, bits and pieces and ideas. And I like, that was sort of like the foundation of my garter stitch knitting, which was the majority of my knitting for the next 25 years. And then probably about eight years ago, I decided, you know, I need to revisit that. And so that's what I did back in 2015. I've been, I've been going through the patterns and extracting every bit of information that I possibly can from that book. And it's been a blast. Will it only work with garter? Well, no, it, the garter stitch, the, the, the reason it's garter stitch is because garter stitch has a, has a mathematical ratio. It, you know, for the most part. So one ridge 
is equivalent to one stitch. And so if you have a box that's like 10 stitches wide by 10 ridges high, so there's gonna be ridges on both sides. So it's, you know, 10 stitches by 20 rows, um, that will roughly equate to a square. The, the wonderful thing about garter stitch is that, and a lot of knitting, but garter stitch in particular is it's very um, adaptable. Like it'll just mold itself to whatever shape that you want it to be. And that was what Virginia really captured in her book. If you, if you have a square and then you pick up in garter stitch and you pick up another square perpendicular, it, perpendicular to it, it just sort of like molds itself to that and and it's it's gives an all-way stretch method which is actually the on the title of her book number knitting the new always stretch method and there are probably lots of other stitches that will have those same proportions but with garter stitch it's just really easy to see the the number of stitches and the number of ridges and and so it just it makes it very simple so i know that you're probably not a patent attorney. No. I, I, you know, once I stumbled upon Dr. Strawn's articles and then looked at some of your videos on YouTube, I sort of got the gist of what was going on and that there was a patent. So I looked up the patents and I mm -hmm. found a patent for her blanket with the butterflies yes. and the lambs. Uh -huh. and I tried to read it and I thought, uh -huh. Please tell me why this is patented. It's like any other pattern. We all follow instructions and we get what the designer designed for us. You know, uh -huh. as do this and we do this and we get a thing. And that doesn't mean that it's worthy right. of a patent. So I was very perplexed. sounds like there are additional patents so just in layman's terms like why do you think that this was so unique that it got to be a patented process so what virginia did that was new for the day and it's it's not uncommon now it's not as common as stitch by stitch instructions but what she did she developed a new method of charting and so she had uh you, you pick up one one unit from another. So let's say you, you knit a 10 by 10 square and you bind off. And then off of the the rising edge, the side of it, you knit another square and then you, you bind off and then you knit another square. And so the, the term number knitting, it has to do with the units, individual units, modular units being picked up one from another. And what she really did in her patent was she numbered them in a particular order. So you could look at the chart and they're going to be numbered except on the patent. They're not, she did it differently in the patent, but like you, you pick up num unit number one and then you knit that. And then you go to unit number two and unit number three and so forth. And it, it bypasses the need for a lot of the, the stitch by stitch instructions, because you can, you can knit a whole sweater just based on a chart. You know, she's got her, her units that are laid out on graph paper and um, each one of them is numbered. And the way that her graph paper works is each um, each square in the graph paper equals a certain number of stitches. And so if you have a, um, a box, a rectangle that's on some graph paper, that's six boxes wide and six boxes high, and each box it equals three, three stitches or three ridges, you would cast on 18 and then you would knit 18 ridges and so she simplified things but she i think the patent is like six pages but she also goes into great depth about how because the stitches are at perpendicular angles to each other it um, it lends for um, a lot more stretch than than just like straight up and down knitting because the the stitches that are at opposing angles they um they pull against each other and so like i don't know if you can you can tell this the sweater that i'm knitting is one of virginia's patterns and because of that um, that crossway stretch, it, it hugs all the curves. And if this sweater was put on a different size body, it would hug their curves too. And it would look fabulous because of the, the stitches that go at opposing angles to each other. So that that's just some of it. I actually put a whole video together, just exp explaining the patent, but it's, um, that's kind of the gist of it is that she developed a new way of charting and, and knitting the fabric that made the fabric behave in a way that normal, like, top-down knitting, it, it doesn't behave the same.
So two things. The first one is a lot of fashion designers in the garment industry cut on the bias Mm -hmm. for that reason, the justice of the fabric. Mm -hmm. The second thing I wanted to say was I looked at some of those charts. You know, I haven't gone into it in depth because I wanted to really hear more from you. And I couldn't see the logic, if you will, of why... I mean, I get that it's different from knitting individual units and then sewing them together. It is. I got that, that you can continue with the same strand of yarn from yes. unit one to unit two to unit three. But when unit three was here and then she's jumping down here to <laughs> four, then I got lost because sure. I consider myself an extremely logical person. I'm trained as an engineer. Yeah. I was not getting that. Why it wasn't like radiating out or going continuously. Do, do you have any explanation for why? I do. Okay. So good. <laughs> sometimes there's a pattern in the book called baby blanket, which is not very descriptive, but it's, it's a, um, it's just a series of like, squares, you know, you got one square like this, and then you, you know, you've got another square like this and it's six squares or nine squares or something. And so, but it's in knit in three colors. And so sometimes the order that you knit the units, she'll have you knit like all the colors, like all the blue together and then all the pink and then all the white. And so that might be one of the reasons, but another reason is there's, there's one sweater called diamond design sweater for women. And it's interesting because normally, like, have you ever heard of like the cozy memories blanket or like a mitered square blanket? And, you know, they're, they're, they're mitered squares, but generally those blankets, the diagonals of those all run in the same direction. I've never seen one that it doesn't, other than Virginia's patterns, where the diagonals of a mitered square run in the same direction or don't run in the same direction. So with Virginia's squares, like she has one called diamond design sweater and she has you, uh, it's knit on the bias. And you you do your miter squares here, and then you work your way up and over the back, right? I have here the the diamond design sweater, and this one is really, they're all really interesting. But this one is uh, especially interesting because of the way that she she charted it. And if you look at the the diagonals here, they go in different directions. See, so some of them at the top are pointing kind of downward, and so you could see that in the from the base of the arm pit up, they were knit upward. But then if you flip this around, they all go downward. And so what she did is she started, she started here with her chart. She has unit up and over the shoulder and then down and then pick up again in the front and work your way down. And so depending on the pattern, sometimes she wants to change the way the diagonals are done. So you can add different kinds of details. It's still so puzzling to me because you could technically knit each of those triangles separately and then assemble them, but it would be individual pieces of yarn. Yes. And Virginia did not like breaking the yarn (laughs) at all. (laughs) She has a whole... Uh, I'll see if I can find it real quick, but she has a whole chart. She's dedicated almost an entire page of her book to um, how to how to organize your different balls of yarn for a pair of little boys' pants, just so that you don't have to break the yarn. And it's a half a page, just like discussing <laughs> the the order in which you use your yarn balls. It's um, and it's the only the only place in the whole book where she did that. It's um. It's amazing. I'm sure I'm not the only person who labors over this myself. When I'm doing something and I have maybe like three or four skeins, I don't want to break into an extra Mm -hmm. skein if I don't have to. So I try and figure out like, what's my optimal way of utilizing my yarn so that I don't have a lot of ends to weave in. Mm -hmm. And if I ever have to rip it out, it's continuous. Um, And I also want to keep the extra skeins intact because yes, 
then I can't do anything with them. I can't sell them. I can't return them. I can't give them to right. someone. So I'm uh -huh. always doing that sort of like complicated jigsaw puzzle. But again, that's like my brain. So it sounds like she was of a similar mindset. Yes, yes and she very much was. Yes. Even though she wasn't an engineer, she was, she was a, you know, as you know, many women back in her era where she finished her official schooling, you know, after, at high school, and then she got married and had a family, but she obviously continued her educating herself in, you know, lots of other things. She was, she was very smart, very intelligent, very well-spoken and, and ran in very, uh, very well-to-do educated circles. Now the book seems to be very pricey. There's, I guess, limited numbers of copies yes. around, but tell yes. us about what you've done to make it available to a wider audience. Yeah. So what I did, I bought my copy. I think it was in 2015. I paid only $150 for mine. Only. <laughs> only. <laughs> only. They're more than that now. <laughs> um, yeah. So I got mine and it's a really, of all the, the physical copies I've seen of number knitting, like out, you know, that other YouTubers have showed or, you know, in the library or whatever, this is the nicest one that I've ever seen. And so I'm pretty happy about that. So well, I got it early. I did. <laughs> People are just yes. getting on the bandwagon maybe now. Yeah. So I, um, what I did is I scanned, like I wanted to make this originally my idea was to republish this and, you know, naive Kelly back in 2015, I was like, I'll just scan it and I'll just like re -knit the patterns just and redraw the charts and like, we'll be done. I can republish it. Can you do that? I mean, well, it, is it under copyright? I, that's another thing that I, I researched. I, I wanted to make sure like all this is on the up and up. And so on a couple of different occasions, I talked to lawyers and like, there's these websites you can go on where you can find a patent attorney and you can like buy, you know, five minutes or 15 minutes of their time or whatever. Like I have this one question and I'll pay you 40 bucks. <laughs> so I did that a couple of times and I, I got some legal advice from a patent attorney. And he said, what you need to do is make sure that the copyright has expired. And the way that you do that is you contact the U.S. Copyright Office and make sure that the copyright for the book has never been transferred to anyone else and find out the date that it expired. Um, and I was like, okay, I can do that. And I contacted the copyright office and they're like, yeah, we could do that for you. It's going to take two hours of research, which is their minimum. And we charge $200 an hour. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so I paid the U S copyright office $400. And then I don't know, a couple months later, I got like the official paper in the mail with the, you know, the U S copyright embossing on it that said that the copyright for this book did expire in I think it was like 79 or something because because I know nowadays the the copyright extends for a certain number of years after the author's death. Well, books published in the 50s or like, you know, before a certain time period, they have they fall under different copyright rules. And I think the, the copyright was that the uh, it was like 50 or something years after the book was published. And so that would have landed the copyright expiration sometime in the 70s. And it never got renewed. And so the, the, the book is officially in the public domain. And so I was like, okay, well, that's good to know. So what I did is I, I scanned the whole thing and I went through, and for the, for people that aren't familiar with it, it's got, you know, it's got all black and white pictures and it's got a lot of charts. It's got, I think over a hundred charts for these, even though there's only 74 patterns in the book, some of like, some of the sweaters have three pages of charts. So I went, I'm an illustrator and a designer by, you know, trade. And so I went through and I redrew all the charts and that took me like a year, <laughs> you know, not full time, but like I, you know, I worked on it for a solid year, redrawing all these things to make them better because some of them are just, it, they're hard to see because of the, the, the coloring on the text. It, it's, and the, the grid lines, they're very similar in tone because they're hand-drawn to the actual charts themselves. And so I went and I redrew them all in my illustration software. Um, and so then I was like, I just need to just, just need to re-knit all these things. But there's 74 patterns in the book. And some of them are pretty straightforward, like, you know, like a little neck scarf, like, okay, that might take me a few days, but some of them are sweaters. A lot of them are sweaters. And what I thought would take a year, I'm eight years in and I still haven't knit all those sweaters.
And a lot of the times, Virginia, she only offered it in one size. And so like, I think this sweater might be one of the ones that was offered in one or two sizes. And there's like a big push for, you know, size inclusivity today and, you know, expanded size ranges. And um, yeah, this book doesn't really have that. I mean, you can adjust it a little bit, but like there's probably no sweaters in here that would easily translate to like a 60 inch bust, you know? Um, and so Are you going to be able to do that in your version or it it's is not your can. It's a challenge because I, I took a sweater that was designed originally and it said in the book it's for someone with a slight figure it's a little bodice blouse and it has you know it's got poofy sleeves it's cute and and when i knit it she said because she only had showed an example in one size but she said if you need it to be larger like this is made for a size you know 32 or 30 inch bust and i was like well what adult woman is a size 30 inch bust nobody <laughs> nobody is and so I I sized it up according to the instructions that she gave you just increase your box number so instead of you know one box equals three it's like one box equals four or whatever but then when I knit it no joke the sleeves were like 24 or 30 inches long like I don't know how long my arm is what but is like that? the sleeves 17. were like this long yeah <laughs> And so just because like one part of the human body expands like in girth doesn't mean that the arms get proportionally longer. And so it's like, I haven't quite figured out how to rectify that. And I like, I could do it for one or two sweaters, but like to do it across all 74, that's like, that's a tall, that's a tall order. <laughs> like you said, some of them are not garments. Some of them are right. shawls, scarves. Uh -huh. So it's not all 74, but maybe the preponderance are garments. Yeah, there's probably, there's probably 15 or 20 of them that are sweaters and they just don't lend themselves easily to sizing up. What about the weight of the yarn? Well, that's another thing because she, Virginia really liked lightweight yarn and, and her, the whole idea behind number knitting because she developed it like kind of during the depression and she had young kids. She, she developed it so that she could use very lightweight yarn on big needles and do it in garter stitch. And because of the, the ridges of garter stitch, they would hold just as much warmth as a sweater knit on smaller needles using thicker yarn. And so, yeah. So she liked, she liked lightweight yarn and you can adjust like some of the, the items you can adjust the, the, the gauge, like, um, like I could easily knit this sweater. This is in lace weight yarn, but I, I could do it on, you know, fingering weight yarn and, you know, a slightly larger needle size. And it would size up for someone else a little bit bigger. Right, that's pretty well. what I was going to say, you know, and if you got into worsted weight or even chunky on right. turkey baster size needles. Right. You could get the well, same effect maybe with a that leads to another issue. Further. <laughs> so what she did, another one of the, the genius ideas that she came up with is she uses something called gauge shifting. And so this sweater, for example, all of the squares, these mitered squares, they're all the same number of stitches all the way up and down. Same with the sweater that I'm wearing. So this square is the same number of stitches as the waist square and the hip square. And what but she does they're is needles. they're on different needle sizes. And so she just adjusts the gauge a bit to have the, the fabric kind of, you know, tuck in. And a lot of the knitting patterns, instead of, you know, cause they're either like top down or bottom up, they actually adjust stitch count and they keep the needle size the same, but that's not what Virginia did. She has you change the needle size. And that works pretty well. A lot of the time, if you're using lace weight, if you're using fingering weight, but when you start using worsted weight and you're using that worsted weight on five different needle sizes, <laughs> it's, it's a little, um, it's a little weird sometimes like it works. Here's a worsted weight sweater. And this is, um, you know, similar to the, the white one with the little V's in it that I showed you. This one is called diamond design sweater for men. Why it's for men. I don't know, maybe because it has long sleeves, but anyway, so I knit this in, in worsted weight and the whole thing 
is done. I think I did it on like size nines or tens, but with the sleeve, she again has you just gauge shift down the sleeve. And so at the top, it's real loose, but as you get down toward the, the cuff, the gauge gets tighter and tighter. And so the fabric down here is just, is more dense. And sometimes that works fine, but other times it's a little weird. And it's also, it seems very difficult to adjust the length of the sleeve. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it can be. It's especially for this one, this, this sweater is wild. So it starts, it starts at the left front hip and she has you work diagonally. Like you've seen the corner to corner blankets. So it's that like she has you work diagonally up and over the back. It's a corner to corner sweater and it ends. Um, no, it ends right here. It starts here and it ends here. And so the whole thing when you're, before you sew it up, it's, it's just, um, like a one big flat piece. It's not knit in the round. It's knit flat. Um, so that's like that Elizabeth sense, Zimmer corner to corner. That's like Elizabeth Zimmerman's baby surprise. Yes. Jet, which I've mm -hmm. never knit, but I sort of, get Oh, it's fun. The concept that it's like uh -huh. bomby and you have to yeah. <laughs> just trust that it's going to come together and actually yes. make a sweater. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of faith in <laughs> attempting her design because you could knit yeah. this whole thing and not know until the very end whether it's mm -hmm. going to fit or not. Yes. And it's, yeah. it seems like it would be hard to modify it. Like, yeah. can't just, <laughs> you know, rip down and redo the neck. This so, is true. Yeah, I have another it's one. It's fascinating that... <laughs> people wanted to dive into this uh quicksand <laughs> yeah yeah it's fun it's like a puzzle which I think is why is why it's so appealing because she she liked to figure out different ways to do things like th some of her blankets are knit concentrically hmm. right and some of them are knit corner to corner and some of them are, are knit from the center out and some of them are knit like, you know, top to bottom. And some of them are knit like, you know, you knit here and then you knit here and then you fill in the corners. Like she, I, I think what made her stuff so interesting is that she was not like a highly trained knitter traditionally, you know, like, a, like the, there was a book that came out during that kind of same time period by um, Ida Riley Duncan, and it was called Progressive Knitting. And Ida Riley Duncan was a, she was a professor or a teacher instructor at, I think, Detroit Public Schools. And she taught dressmaking and she taught knitting. And, and she put together this book called uh, Progressive Knitting. And it was, it outlined the right way to do things. And that book was like a training book that the yarn shopkeepers would have their employees use to teach people the right way to do things. And Virginia talked in her book about the snooty yarn shop employees that were <laughs> that were rude to her and and how she didn't like she like wanted to do things her own way and she actually used the term pro progressive um, knitting in her book she didn't mention Ida Riley Duncan's book but she used that phrase and I was like oh <laughs> maybe she was familiar with that book but 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 Virginia also she quotes um uh, Mary Thomas's book of knitting, like she spoke very highly of it. And Mary Thomas was like, just kind of in, instead of saying, this is the right way to do it. She was more like, these are ways that you could do it. Like, try this, try that. And have you thought about this way? And like, she, she was more of like laying sort of like spreading out all the options for people of different ways to think about things. And I think that Virginia really liked that very much because Virginia was not encumbered by the right way to do things. Like she, she wanted to do it her own way. And so I think that is what led her, but what gave her the ability to like come up with all this wild stuff because like she didn't know any better. Well, it she said, I invented like number knitting so nobody could tell me how to do it, that I was doing it wrong. It seems to me like she was having a great time. She was having mm -hmm. a whole, but- it's not yet clear to me how that's transferable to other people. <laughs> it doesn't sound like she's getting into ways that you could make it work for you. I mean, she's trying to free herself, but it doesn't sound mm -hmm. like she's freeing me. Like right. you know, if I need it shorter and I need the arm shorter or the neck narrower, 
um, those options may not be so available to me. So, right. I mean, it's interesting. And I, I really um, salute you for trying to advance it because certainly the shawls and the blankets would be interesting. No fit. Oh, yeah. Up. No fit mm -hmm. in them. So, you know, yeah, to be safe. Um, I wanted to show you this. You're probably familiar with Log Cabin. Oh, yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. So, I, you know, when I started to look at Virginia Woods Bellamy's concept, it made me think immediately of this because, well, for people who don't know, let me see if I can hold this. So, you start with a square. And this is obviously garter stitch. Mine is not in a solid color, but you can see that, that that's a square. And then you pick up the stitches, in my case, with a different color of yarn, but I could have used the same yarn. And you knit the same width, and then you come down here and you knit the width of these first two pieces. So I'm not sure if this is golden ratio-ish, but it's a similar concept. It goes around like a nautilus mm -hmm. shell. And you can yeah. keep expanding outwards and make it as large as you want. Yeah. I mean, you can always have a square. I mean, here's one square from the pink to the turquoise. But then I went further because I wanted a bigger square. I mean, as long as I'm showing this, I may as well show. Here's the back of the sweater. It's The whole thing isn't done in log cabin. Oh, nice. So it's it's a similar idea, and I wonder yes. if it might have influenced her in some way, because I imagine Log Cabin has been around since the beginning oh, yeah. of quilting. Yes. Yeah, she actually has a couple of Log Cabin designs in her in the number knitting book. But in my my research, I've also been trying to track down all the instances of when she was featured in McCall's Needlework and Women's Home Companion. And she had issued three number knitting pamphlets uh, over the series of, I don't know, about five or six years. And one of them, it actually, I think it's number knitting pamphlet number one. And it has in there a, a women, a mother's bed jacket that's the, it's done in a log cabin style. And it has a matching uh, baby jacket also done in a log cabin style. It has a matching baby hat and a baby blanket and placemats. And they're all done in log cabin style. That's before her book. That was before the book. I think that one oh, did was influence her in 45 was when that pamphlet came out. Do you have those pamphlets? Can you, I have one of them. I, I haven't been able to track down pamphlets two and three. I have the reference. I have like the, the pictures of the advertisements for them in the McCall's uh, magazines. Cause I collect those <laughs> for this purpose. But as far as the actual like pamphlet itself, I, I only have a digital copy of the one of number knitting pamphlet number one. And there's only one library in the country that has it on file and it's the university of Chicago. And I paid $60 for them to scan it for me, <laughs> send me a copy. <laughs> so, so yes, it, I have that one. It's lovely. It's an pit. I mean, you can just keep going and going. Yes. Keep well, throwing money at it. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but Dr. Strawn has several pieces that were knit by Virginia herself. I'm jealous. Yes. Yeah, that's she awesome. She talks about that in my interview with her. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of magical and special. It is. Yeah. I mean, to be in touch with her children, you know, she got, yeah. And other people who she knows, you know, right. They, got to the source after Virginia nice. passed away. So, yeah. Um, in her articles, I saw a picture of the red dress, which mm -hmm. intrigued me. But after a little email exchange with you, I decided I don't think I want to go down that. Path. It, seems, <laughs> it seems a little frightening to me. You know, it's, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be frightening. Some of the the sweaters can be a little tricky because the the nature of a of a sweater is that it's um, you know, we expect it to fit a certain shape. Um, and I like my sweaters. You know, I don't like boxy sweaters. That does not work for me and my style and my figure. Um, but so for me, I like my sweaters to have a certain shape. But the that dress, that red dress, is very is very loose. It's very free flowing and it's, um, it's got long sleeves and it's, 
it's the kind of thing that you'd wear like out to maybe a fancy dinner or going to a play. It's not the kind of thing that like I would wear when I'm doing housework, you know? So oh, like no. the whole, like the fancy, <laughs> like the long sleeves that would get in the way. Cause they, you know, they're like excessively long glossy sleeves like that. That's not really my kind of a style, but like I, knowing, having knit almost all of Virginia's patterns in number knitting, I, I can confidently say how that was constructed and it's squares. <laughs> so it's a lot of knitting because it's a lot of fabric, but, um, but like the actual knitting itself isn't that difficult. Charting it might be, I don't know the chart might, might take me like an hour, but like, you don't need to be nervous about that. You could do it. It would take a while because it's huge. <laughs> it's a very, it's a very big glassy dress. Most everything I knit takes a while because I'm always pretty much in fingering weight. Not everything. But, yep. Um, I understand so that. <laughs> I've knit many things that take three and four months. But I was oh, yeah. going to ask you about timing. The things that you've made, for example, what you're wearing. Mm -hmm. does that take? Did that take you longer than a conventional sweater of the same size and shape? I don't think so. Honestly, I haven't knit many other sweaters outside of the ones that Virginia made. Like I've, I could think of maybe two other ones that I've knit. So almost all of my sweater making has been Virginia's patterns How because, because so many of the sweaters that I've seen, they're so boxy and I don't look, I don't like boxy outfits, like boxy shape. Like that doesn't, that I just really don't me. either because my figure is boxy. So I don't want to like emphasize right. that. I do have yeah. a piece, luckily, but a lot of vintage knits are not boxy. You That's true. But a lot of vintage, vintage knits are very fiddly and they're like stitch by stitch instructions. And you start, you're like fingering weight lace on <laughs> wait, number, wait. Those two needles. Wait, and it's just don't talk to me about fiddly. What you're doing seems fiddly to me. Oh yeah. So I, I guess it, you know, we all are different styles of knitters and we all have different ways of processing information. And the, the thing I love about Virginia's patterns is that, so I'm, I do technical publishing for a living. And so at the end of the day, I don't really have that much brain power left, but I can knit a square and I can knit a mitered square. Like I can decrease in the center. Like I have that much brain power left. And so I can handle Virginia's patterns at the end of the day. Like, okay, I got half an hour to knit. I just, I just need to decompress a bit and I can knit in garter stitch and I don't have to think about anything until maybe I finish this square and I have to cast on the next one. And then I have to think about something, but like the whole stitch by stitch instructions that takes pages and pages and pages. And like, it's just, it's too much, too much for me. And Virginia's stuff is all garter stitch. Vintage patterns, the most complicated sweater can be like one or two pages. So oh. this is something that is, I think, unique to modern patterns that people oh, okay. go into, you know, infinite amount of detail. And really all they're yeah. doing is something that's, you know, kind of simple. Um, yeah. The shoulder shape. Eight and, pages. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think <laughs> I don't have that much time. I hope none of those people are watching probably don't pay any attention to me because I'm, you know, more vintage knitter, but yeah. I, that's my take. I've knit some continuous mm -hmm. patterns and I've seen those things that go on endlessly. In fact, in one of my early episodes, I showed the pattern that I was working from and I said, this is it. This is all there is. It's just, yeah. you know, these two columns and then a little bit on another page and it was a complicated sweater. Yeah. With lots of parts. But see, in vintage patterns, there could be two fronts, a back, two sleeves, and then there might be patch pockets at the hips, and there might be some little pocket sort of thing going on up here. There might be a belt, there might be a collar, the collar might be lapels and the back. So there can be a lot of small parts that you have to assemble, mm -hmm. which for me is that jigsaw puzzle thing. So yeah. I'm into that. I like that. But of course there are vintage patterns that are a couple of pieces too. Right. But usually they are knit flat and assembled. That's right. where we get our fit, the vintage knitters, because mm -hmm. you can 
change. Like you can do um, waist shaping. Yes. And my waist may be different from your waist. So I might want to decrease at a different rate for a right. different number of rows. But I have that power over my knitting. Sometimes mm -hmm. I screw up and I have to redo it. But I feel empowered by that, that I can make it fit me. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. my reservation about this knitting, number knitting system that when I'm all done, I, I wouldn't be able to alter it. And I have a problem figure. So that that's important for me. However, it still is fascinating to think that somebody got patents and right. that people, how many years later, 70 years later, are still intrigued by it. So mm -hmm. bully for her. Now you have yeah. other things that you want to show us, I'm assuming. Oh, sure. Um, let's see. Tell me about this the green a... ribbon. What's the, oh. what's the ribbon in the background? So I went to Rhinebeck a few weeks ago. Oh, and I was there. Too bad we yeah. had a minute. Yes. They were, they had, um, I'm competitive. I'm highly competitive. And they had a chopstick knitting competition. They and did. I, I they did. That. And I, I wanted to go. And I, you know, I showed up like 10 minutes beforehand because I thought like, I didn't know that there was a cutoff for how many participants they're like, we're full. Sorry. And I was like, dang it. But they had a crochet competition, a speed crochet, like an hour later. And I was like, okay. And so I showed up and I did speed crochet <laughs> with the, with the people that rang back and I got sixth place, which is, and they gave me this handy dandy little ribbon for speed crochet. And they even provided the crochet hook and the, the yarn and everything. And so this is my first crochet competition. So that's what that's about. Well, congratulations. I figured if, if you're going to get sixth place in a crochet competition, Rhinebeck is the place to do it because that's like <laughs> where all the, the rock stars are in the fiber world. What so, did you have to do? Oh, let me show you. So they gave us this, <laughs> this ball of yarn and you got to choose between, um, they had Susan Bates crochet hooks and boy crochet hooks. You know, some of them have like the flat shank and some of them have like more of a rounded shank. And so I, I forget which is my favorite, but I have a favorite. And so I, I got, I swapped with another girl who had the kind that I wanted. And so we had, I think it was 10 minutes, either five or 10 minutes and a ball of yarn. And we had to crochet as fast as you can. And so I did. And Any that's, one? Uh, it had to be double crochet. It had to be double crochet. Okay. Yeah. And you had to do as many as you could in the specified time. Yeah. It was fun. Very good. The so that's what the ribbon's place, for. The first place winner, how big was his or her? Thing? It was probably about 30% larger than mine. And incidentally, I think it was the girl that I swapped hooks with. She got first place. And I was like, how, like, how is that, how is it possible that you could crochet that fast? Cause I'm fast. And she was like way faster. <laughs> Yeah. So here's another fun thing. And this isn't in, in Virginia's book, but I came up with it myself, but it's, it's inspired by number knitting. And so Virginia had seven shapes that she used. She used the square rectangle, uh, right and left triangles, a center triangle or like a mitered triangle. And she, uh, she called it a divided triangle. She also had the divided square, which we know now is the mitered square. And she also had what she called single wing and double wing, uh, which is basically a parallelogram or like a, a chevron pattern. So she had seven shapes, but um, I made this sweater in the style in that it uses the gauge shifting. Um, but instead of the, the seven shapes that Virginia used, I used a corner to corner square and I used a... Um, it's like a variegated yarn that has really long colorways. Um, like normal skeins are like, you know, about this big around. I have a friend who is a yarn dyer and she has a skein, a, like a mega skein winder <laughs> that her, her neighbor built for her. And so her skeins were like, I don't know, six or eight feet around. And so you can get, when you dye a skein like mega like that, you can get different color effects than you can with like a little skein. And so, um, yeah, so I made this sweater corner to corner squares using gauge shifting. So it's like bigger at the bust, bigger needles at the bust and smaller needles at the waist. And I used this um, hand dyed variegated yarn. 
So when you pull that up, it it does appear to be more or less rectangular, but you're Uh saying it stretches because of this bias to Uh hug your figure. It does. Yeah. Okay. So that, yeah, for somebody who has a real hourglass figure, it could be, if you want to make a tube top, (laughs) it's great. (laughs) Perfect. Here's another fun one that I made. This one is called. But wait, before you move on, before you move on, you did some kind of band around the neckline and the arm holes. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah, they're just smaller squares, smaller corner to corner squares. Oh. But because of the, they just stretch a little bit. Once you wear it, instead of being square shaped, they just kind of like, you know, they they morph and they just become more rectangular shaped. I thought on the red sweater, it had a rib turtleneck. It did. Is that yeah. um, artistic license or did she call for that? She actually called for that. She called for a rib turtleneck, but mine was, my, was I made possible? mine bigger. <laughs> she does have a few places in the book where she calls for ribbing at like the, the waistline of some of the sweaters and the neckline of some of the sweaters. She has you do ribbing. Yeah. Well, that's like, I made mine. Like I showed this to someone once and like, Oh, eighties style. It's chunky. <laughs> yeah. That's it's like the most shocking thing that she actually yeah. like would allow you and encourage you to do ribbing because it's oh, yeah. so not her. Yeah. Yeah. She, she used ribbing on occasion and it, um, it works out. It worked out marvelously. Well, it looks great. Yeah. I mean, that Thank does you. look great. <laughs> so this one is called, um, this one is called the Hampton sweater for women. And you can see in the, the top here, how the the diagonals kind of radiate out from the center and then the the bottom of the sweater they go downward and i think on the back side they they all go in you know kind of one direction see how they're mirrored right and left and so she very much liked to play with the diagonals on her her sweaters to really use them as a design element yeah. And so this, this sweater, I, I'm not a fan of gauge swatching. I know I should do it. I don't, I'm just like, I take, I'll, I'll swatch, I'll cast on for the project. I'll work at it for like 20 minutes. And if it looks pretty good, I'll just go for it. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't wash it. I don't block it. Like, I'm just like I'll forge ahead. <laughs> I've got sweaters to knit. And so I knit this one and it, it is, um, I think I knit it I guessed wrong on the number of stitches I needed for my square because I guessed and I didn't swatch. And so this thing, it's either 11 or 12 inches across. And so if you go in a, you know, measure circularly, that's 24 inches, which is child size. (laughs) This thing fits it. See, it's 11 inches across, but look how much it stretches because of the garter stitch. And so, I mean, it's a little short, it's kind of a belly shirt, but like I could totally wear it and it's comfortable and it, and it fits and it hugs and in the garter stitch with the crossway stretch, it it's magical. Well, I'm getting more and more intrigued. Good. <laughs> I hope viewers are as well. Um, yeah. I think that bias thing is probably the ticket, you know, mm-hmm. if you need that, that's a good thing to have. Yeah. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love the little trim though, the, that they're smaller boxes. Does she, oh, yeah. does she get into gauge? Like, do you, I mean, does she recommend swatching so you know what gauge you're getting? Or she mentions that like to use in passing at the beginning. Be sure to, you know, I don't even think she mentions washing, but she says, you know, get gauge. But then her gauge is not. Uh, like the gauges now are like, you know, you need to get 10.75 stitches over four inches or whatever. And they're like down to the, the fraction of a stitch per inch. And it's not, Virginia, she plays kind of fast and loose with that. And she's not as as particular. And she does her gauge uh, over one inch. So, you know, four stitches to the inch, five stitches to the inch. And sometimes it's one and a half stitches to the inch or two stitches to the inch. Like it's on really big needles. And so she doesn't, she's not as rigid about gauge as a lot of modern patterns are, or even a lot of vintage patterns. Um, 
yeah but she does she does tell you what gauge you should get but like some of the sweaters like i think this used six different sizes of needles and she doesn't say what your gauge should be on each needle size she hopefully will say what your gauge should be on one of the needle sizes and then you just like size up and down accordingly you well, know even though needles one size me, smaller even though she's only saying you know five stitches to the inch I personally wouldn't make a one inch swatch because it's not going to be very accurate. I'm not a machine that it's going to be the same right. every time. So mm -hmm. you know, I would want to knit a sizable swatch so that I could take an average. You should. That's and smart. I can't imagine that she was suggesting just knit one inch and count. Probably not. She was probably doing a bigger swatch, but it seems like in vintage patterns, they're not saying to do a 10 centimeter or four inch swatch they're also just giving eight stitches to the inch or mm -hmm. whatever it might be yeah people can do and is that five. before or after you wash it <laughs> there's well, no mention today, of that <laughs> today i mean today we have I, I would imagine a much wider variety of yarns available we do. To us mm -hmm. that behave in all different kinds of ways so right I would think that you would want to wash before yeah. you swatch. Do I? Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Not Especially you. with superwash. Sometimes I don't knit with superwash, but oh, good. Generally, no. It's like unreliable. <laughs> you know, I want to know where I'm at. Yeah, <laughs> I don't want to leave a lot to chance. Sometimes you have to. Um, Interestingly, though, this is garter and it does have plenty of stretch, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. now, this is not bias, but I guess that's a property of garter. It's not as tight, you know. Um, in your garments, are you able to block and get them? Like you said, one thing is a little on the short side. Could you block it and get it to be longer? Um, not really. It's, it'll go back once, where it'll one. go back yeah and you know that's fine it's it's fine i i think next time i would probably just make like add some squares at the bottom like i would lengthen it now that i've knit enough of these to know like <laughs> what an appropriate length of sweater needs to be especially for a middle-aged woman because <laughs> i you know i'll wear a belly shirt around the house but i'm not gonna like go grocery shopping in it <laughs> maybe to the beach wear i wear it out. when you wear them outside do people stop you and say oh that's so interesting where did you get that uh only people that know i'm a knitter so like my neighbor the other day she saw me wearing this and she said did you knit that but normally no people don't they don't because they don't you get it have a clue and that's fine yeah well there is something fun about wearing your stuff and getting compliments there is yes there is yeah, because I had I was at Rhinebeck and I I was wearing a um let's see oh yeah here it is I was wearing this sweater at Rhinebeck and this is the Hampton sweater and I I was wearing this and someone that I was chatting with said what sweater pattern is that because you know a lot of the popular sweater patterns like you know we people that are on Ravelry a lot, like they're familiar with what's hot and what the, you know, like the ranunculus sweater, like, you know, whatever the other, you know, very famous sweaters are that thousands of people have knit. Love like, what sweater pattern is that? And I told her and like, she hadn't, she hadn't heard of it. And she had certainly hadn't seen it because it's, it's unusual to have a mitered square sweater that, that has the angles going in different directions. Anyway. Also, the yarn is very interesting. Thank you. I made it. It's hand spun. Oh, wow. So you do a lot of different things. You <laughs> wear a lot of different things. And you crochet. Uh-huh. And you publish. Yeah. <laughs> do patent uh, research. research. I do. Yes. <laughs> I feel like a slacker. <laughs> And you podcast. Yeah. And you yeah. have children? No, I don't have any kids. Oh, but I do have a couple of yep. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple of businesses that we are very busy with that don't have anything related to that aren't knitting related at all. So yeah, we keep our days are are very full with activities and and making things. 
So, yeah. All right, let's see Fun. more because I know you have a lot more to show us. I do. Um, let's see. Oh, this is a fun one. So I, I got that number knitting pamphlet number one from the University of Chicago. And it had this, um, this picture of this, it's called the five points shawl. And I've never seen a shawl like it. And so it's interesting in that it covers. So I, I got the, oh no, that was a number knitting pamphlet number two. I just have a picture of it. And so I don't actually have the pamphlet. I just have a picture of the completed garment, but I know how Virginia charts stuff. Cause I've, you know, I've been working on her stuff for years. And so I just looked at the picture and I redrew the chart and a, a few of us knitted it. And so this is interesting because it, it has the, it covers your back, but it also has this like tie thing in the front. And then it's also got these other two tie things. So it like it it fully covers your your body in multiple ways, and you can also Virginia said that you there's like six different ways to wear, and I don't I don't know if I figured out all six, but you could like tie it over your head to like keep your ears warm, and then these front ones you could tie the front ones, and so like it's it's different than a normal shawl that just lays across the back. Like this has got multiple components to it that keep the body warm and i've never seen a modern shawl like this that's got all of that in one garment and that's called the five points shawl so she was super artistic mm -hmm. she's not doing a, any kind of basic shape not generally i mean there's there's a few patterns in the beginning of the book because her, her book was based on her correspondence course and so she has you, you know, do the introductory lessons and then the introductory shapes. And she has you make a, a whole garment based on each shape. So she has you make a triangle and then it's a headscarf or make like a, a square. And I forget what this, oh, and it's like this blousey sort of a thing that you're supposed to like tie it back here and tie in the back, sort of like the way that people would wear bandanas, like in the fifties, you know, they'd wear them as like these little halter top sorts of things mm -hmm. um but as the book progressed she gets more and more complicated with her shapes and her construction methods wow yeah <laughs> and then at the end there's this the end chapter is called to the adventuresome knitter and they don't even have charts it's just pictures of like stuff that her students have made and not so, even any instructions <laughs> it's like art where I mean, it is really like wearable art. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. And it's neat because throughout the book, she credits everyone that knit everything. So the, the lady from Panama and her, her friend, Connie and her, um, she has her friend, um, Rosamund that she mentions. And so she gives name credit to everybody that knit anything for the book and, or had anything to do with her knitting development or, you know, her patent or her publication or anything, all of those people are, are mentioned in the book, even like down to her mailman. <laughs> she, she lists these people and it's just tremendous that like, she, she cared so much about all these people to list them in her book. And well, she was uh, I've been doing, researching them too. If she was doing a correspondence course, it seems like her mailman was very important to her <laughs> without him. I thought about that. Nothing. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I, cause I did research on the mailman <laughs> and at one point, and I don't know when the cutoff was like when he switched from horse mail delivery to car mail delivery, but, but I did some research on the mailman <laughs> and the Elliott Maine historical society actually has a whole article on him about like he, when he, he would deliver mail on horseback. Right. And at some point in time, he sold his horse to someone else in town and the horse, every time the horse came to a mailbox, he'd stop <laughs> because that's what he had been doing for years. So yeah, she, she, and so she credits Maynard to Douglas, the mailman. <laughs> How sweet. Yes. Yeah. Where, She's where amazing. Did she, live? she was in Maine. Well, she, she grew up in, she was born, I believe in Providence, Rhode Island. And when she was um, early teens, her, her father, he was a pastor, he took a church in New Jersey. And so her high school years were spent in New Jersey. Um, 
I believe she also uh, spent some time, no, not Providence, Baltimore. She was born in Baltimore or she lived a lot of her life in Baltimore. And there's like still a lot of, you know, people from her family in Baltimore and around that area. Her father's church is still in Maryland. It's still going. They named it after him. Uh, after she got married, she moved or like I, when she got married, her first husband in 18, I think it was 14. Um, they lived in New York for a number of years. And so the, the, the details that I have of her life, they're a little sketchy. I'm trying to like, I, I, I'm doing a lot of research to try to fill in those gaps, but so she lived in New York, she lived in Manhattan and, um, they were like very active in the New York social scene, the New York arts and musical scene and poetry and all that. And, um, then she, at, I think it was 1925 got divorced. She remarried in 26. They lived in cold spring Harbor, uh, for a number of years. And so that was, I think I have that from the 1930 census at some point in time, probably in the early forties, she, um, at this point was divorced. I don't know when the second divorce took place. She moved to Elliott, Maine, which is a little small town in Maine. And she lived there for a while. I don't know that place. Is it on the coast? Um, it's sort of kind of inland a bit. It's on her. She lived on the river, the Piscataqua river, um, it's it's near Blue Hill Falls, Maine. So she she lived in Elliott, Maine. They're small towns. <laughs> Blue Hill Falls, um, which is because she her daughter was at the University of Maine, I think, Orano, if that's how you pronounce it, Maine. And so she lived in Maine for like the remainder of her years from like nine, early 40s until her her passing in the 70s. So she she spent a lot of time, like her whole life was up, you know, up north. But yeah, her later years were in Maine. You definitely need sweaters there. It's cold. Yeah. And she always lived on the water. Like I've I've researched, except for that one house in um in Manhattan where she lived with her first husband. Uh I forget Fifth Fifth Street or Fifth Avenue or something, but it was in, in it both. was like there is Fifth yeah. Avenue, but there's also Fifth Street. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember the address, but like all the places that I've researched from um, you know, Cold Spring Harbor and onward they're always on the water, like one block away from the water. And she mentions that in her book, she's always been within sight and sound of running water. Like, yep. <laughs> so I've checked. This is true. Well, so, Fifth Avenue is in the center of Manhattan. Uh -huh. it might only be half a mile to the water, but it's not right on the water. Fifth Street, you could go all the way from river to river, I hmm. imagine. So maybe she lived on one of the two rivers yeah maybe i am i have it in my file to know somewhere. her address and if yeah it's still standing oh it is it yeah is. yeah i found it on zillow <laughs> it sold recently for like 1.2 million dollars for this like little <laughs> this little apartment yeah it was lovely and all the places the the place she lived in cold spring harbor and the the places she she's lived in maine they're they're very rural like lots of trees windy roads very very oh, rural, cold spring which, harbor if i'm not mistaken is the gold coast of long island the oh. northern shore of long island huh. it's very um she she oh it's interesting so posh i i think i mean i'll check that but i'm, yeah. I'm pretty sure I would imagine that it's probably very artsy. Probably. She did seem to run in artistic circles. Yeah. Yeah. She was amazing. <laughs> Long Island, parts of it are spectacularly beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have never been there, but I, I'd like to someday to, to go up north and to <clears throat> visit, you know, the different towns in Maine where she lived and, you know, well, next see year, the if places. You come to Rhinebeck. Yeah. Yeah. And I didn't do a great job planning this year at Rhinebeck. I, I got my dates off. So I was, a, we drove all the way to New York, which was like a three-day drive. Well, we took That's our time. But, um, <laughs> must have well, at our pace, yourself. it was. <laughs> so yeah. we, we went up there leisurely, but like I got my dates off. And so I was at, only able to go to Rhinebeck for one day, but hopefully next year we'll like, I will do a better job planning <laughs> and I'll be able to go for more than one day and, and plan some stop offs along the way and um and and find like go see some of the places where virginia lived i would love that
if I may recommend, I know you're not asking yeah. me for my advice, I would do Maine before I went to Rhinebeck because okay. the trees are probably changing. Oh, yeah. Like check the farmer's almanac, but I would think that the trees are changing up yeah. there before they're changing in New York. And it's probably a spectacular. I've been to Maine a couple of times, but never in the fall. I bet it's really beautiful. I'm sure it is. Yeah. It's Put to me on the calendar for next year. I haven't been in all 50 states. I think I've been in about 45. Mm -hmm. I think Maine is perhaps the prettiest. Hmm. Nice. A very unusual coastline, very rocky, and it has all these little villages and their yeah. orchids growing wild along oh. the, side of the road. Huh. Interesting. I thought orchids were tropical. A lot of artists wow. make their homes up there. They have summer places. Hmm. It's very picturesque. And there's nice. a lot, there's an active photography scene too. There's some little red shack that they say is the most photographed building in the United States, maybe in wow. the, because a lot of photographers go there to photograph it. It's got interesting colors. It's got all these like buoys hanging on the side of it. Oh, wow. And the light, the, the light there is a little bit different being so far north. I, I don't know. Uh -huh. But oh, neat. Yeah, I'm excited. It, yeah, it's lovely. And then there's other places along the way, Rhode Island, Newport, and it would be after the season. So you might be able to actually get places to stay. Mm -hmm. Some are yeah. really big. That would be, that would be neat. I, I've been wanting to go see the lighthouses up there. One of the, the ladies that Virginia mentions repeatedly in her book was named Connie Small. Um, Constance Chauville Small. And in, I think it was 1920, she married a lighthouse keeper. And so they worked for 25 years on different lighthouses off the coast of Maine. And she put out a book too, called um, The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife, just telling of her story and, you know, her, her life as a lighthouse keeper's wife and like all that entailed. And she, even after they were done, you know, on the coast, keeping the lighthouses, and they moved into town and got electricity. <laughs> and got to live on the mainland um i think she lived in the same town as virginia but she she talks about the the rugged coastline and the seasons and you know what it was like up there and so it's um it's it's neat looking back and reading the the stories of the the women who've gone before us from that region so it kind of gives me like a road map of things that i'd like to go see well i hope you get to do that yeah all right, next sweater. How many do you have? Oh, or maybe um, not sweaters, but I have I probably have about 40 pieces here next to me. I probably have about a dozen sweaters. Okay. Well, whatever you want to show us. <laughs> okay. I was a couple of years ago randomly recruiting test knitters, like who wanted to knit number knitting stuff, and then just willy-nilly, like, hey, whatever you want, you know, just pick it from Ravelry and I'll send you the chart and you know, go for it good luck. And then one lady, she picked out the last, the last pattern in the book, the very last pattern in the book that had a chart. And I didn't really think anything of it at the time. Um, but once I got to knitting it, I realized this could be a problem. So this is the chart. It's on the bias. It's called diamond design sweater. It seems straightforward enough. Here's the picture of it, right? Notice how it's tucked into her dress. Why? <laughs> There's a reason. Apparently. There's a reason. Yeah, so once I knit it, first of all, the armhole was only three inches deep. <laughs> so I had to I had to make some modifications to the armhole. And but then once I knitted, it was a crop top, which you know is okay. I suppose, but like, I'm not getting any younger. So I had to add um, divided squares at the bottom to make it work right. So the rest of it is all divided squares or mitered squares, but they're going on the bias, right? So the diagonal is up and down. But then to add some length to it, I had to add these squares kind of like wrapping around the outside. But then there was the challenge of picking up from a bias edge, but like picking up so some of the, the body was on the bias, but like these extra squares at the bottom weren't going to be on the bias and the proportion of stitches is different. 
So I had to work it that out. Benches differently. It it is because if you pick up on the bias at a one to one ratio, it's going to compress in, because the, um, I I figured out since then the there's about the the bias cast on edge like each stitch is about one point four times a regular stitch size because it's on the bias, and so you have to calculate you have to adjust for that difference when you're picking up from the bias if you don't want your your garments to stretch or like pucker in that area. So we redrew, I redrew the chart to like lengthen it, uh, like a whole nother row of diamonds at the bottom. And that's, that's when this sweater, that's how it ended up being longer and more appropriate length, <laughs> because this was take two from that same sweater pattern. Um, yeah. The, so the, you the, some of the, the chart to get it to be longer. I had to, yeah, I had to redo the chart to, to add another row because in the original one, it's got this, um, in the center here, it's got a divided triangle. And then you work the divided triangle and that's it. So what I did is I turned that into a divided square mm -hmm. and then just added the divided triangle at the end of that. So it effectively down. lengthened it a bit. Yeah. I don't even <laughs> want like, to hear what you did to get the armhole bigger. Oh, that actually wasn't that big of a deal because she had it like this was supposed to be the armhole depth, right? Which is not sufficient. Like I don't like have my armholes pinched. And so um, this, this is like a divided, divided square that kind of like wraps around. It originally was going all the way up there. And so I just split it. And so I work part of the divided square on one side and part of the divided square on the other side. And once I got to here, I just joined it together and continued down. So that wasn't that big of a deal. Um, it was a little disheartening while I was knitting it. Cause at this point I had like nine test knitters. They're like, this armhole is really small. And I, and I was like, eh. <laughs> but then that's when I was like, oh dear, I can't just like open this up for test knitters and not knit everything with them. Like, well, I, I have to do it all with them. I wonder what happened. I wonder how that happened. It must have been the same for Virginia. Yeah, yeah. But she had a really good photo stylist. So so the guy, there was two photographers mentioned in the book and one of them was named Douglas Armston. And the second one was, I forget his name, but the second one was like a, a real fashion photographer. And so the real fashion photographer took like these glam shots of, of the models, but Douglas Armston was, you know, he was a local guy and, and his shots were, you know, they were different. So like this photo, this was by the fashion photographer, right? Doesn't she look glamorous? This photo was by Douglas Armston, the local guy. And he, I think he did like a lot of, you know, family portraits and scenery and you know that sort of thing but the fashion photographer was decidedly different than Mr. Uh, Armston like here's another one done by the fashion photographer and so the some of the sweaters in here they they hid the ill fit like they would position the model at a weird angle or they would like tuck it in to her skirt or like they would hide it they would hide it somehow and um oh this this They're is a good one today. You know, when you see something in Vogue magazine, they've got clamps in the back. Oh so yeah. Get it to be where they want it to be. So this sweater, I knit this and when it lays flat, it looks exactly like that. It looks awesome. Flat. When you put this thing on, it's, it's got a keyhole opening that goes down to here. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And it's just like wide open. And so it's like, boom. <laughs> but you could stitch it up. You could. But I was like, oh, that's why it's not, they don't show a picture of anyone wearing it. <laughs> it's, it's like, it's Cleavage City. <laughs> oh, it's, it's hysterical. So I knit another one with a smaller keyhole, but it's just, there's so many things that one can only learn about this book by knitting through it. Like it's easy to just like flip through like, oh, charts. Oh, that's nice. Oh, you know, sweaters, you know, like, oh, okay. It's just, 
garter stitch. It's easy to just write it off, but like having knit through it. And then like, after you've spent, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 hours knitting something and you compare your, your finished object to the picture in the book. And you're like, Oh, I see what you did, but you'd never have that experience. Had you not, had you not knitted it yourself? It's tremendous. <laughs> well, okay. I mean, this seems like not for the faint of heart. <laughs> Big commitment. It's fun. It makes sense now why no one else has ever tried to republish it. Because mm -hmm. I early on, I did contact a couple of publishers and they're like, yeah, you know, maybe it, let us know when you're done, you know, with your, with your layout, which assume is that like, I've done all of it. Like I've redrawn all the charts, knitted it, photographed it, everything. Let us know when you're done. And I, I think, I think maybe that's why, because to actually re rework this whole thing in its entirety, I mean, I can't even tell you how many thousands of hours that would take. And like, no, no publisher is, is in this small of a niche is going to front up any money or any respectable amount of money, like, like upfront, I don't know what they call that for authors in advance. So it's, it's the sort of thing one would only have to do like for my own, like personal edification, because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. no, no publisher is going to pay me, you know, you'll sell some copies, but you're not going to yeah. sell a million copies. No. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> well, it's a labor of love, I guess. And it a is. hobby, maybe. You oh, know, yeah. The definitely. challenge is there. Uh -huh. You get garments that you enjoy. Do. And you can say you made them. And uh -huh. you get to yeah. talk to me and yes. share with other people what you've done. And maybe, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I hope I'm not discouraging anybody from trying it. I think it's very interesting. But like you suggested to me, if you're going to do it, don't start with the dress. Don't start, start at the end. Start at the beginning. <laughs> simple. So is that the case that if you start at the beginning of the book, you work your way through and you're learning more yes. as you go through? Uh-huh. Yeah. Because she, because it's a correspondence, it was based on her correspondence course. And so she she will drop little tidbits of information, little nuggets of information throughout. And so if there's information that you need on like page 200 and she mentioned it on page 75, she's not going to mention it again. And so if you skipped past all that, it's, it's easy to just like, like, what the heck? Like, wh where's the rest of the instructions? Oh, they're on page, you know, 40. <laughs> I told you that already. Like, right. She doesn't repeat herself. So that part is a little is a little hard for modern knitters because we're used to like every, every tidbit of information that you need to know for a pattern is going to be on that page or in that like $6 Ravelry download. Mm -hmm. And they expect that. But if, if one was to do that for every pattern in this book, this thing would be like 2000 pages long. And so when you're all done with this project, when you have the whole thing complete and you're going to publish it digitally, it sounds like, will people be able to buy individual patterns or that just doesn't make any sense whatsoever? You have to buy the whole book. Well, I don't really have a hard and fast plan for republishing this. I, at this point, what I'm doing, cause I, I, I digitized this and I finally made it for sale. Like, I don't know, a few years after I digitized it. And it, so this, the digital version of this is available for sale on, in my, my shop, my wrap, my Etsy and my knit swag shop. But as far as the physical hard copy, um, I, I don't know how and when that will ever be republished because I'm still trying to formulate in my mind what it would be. Cause some of the sweater patterns are like kind of dated and some of them only come in one size. And like, I'm just, I'm just not, I'm not clear on if it will ever be a brand new number knitting because the, the knitters of today expect something so much different than the knitters of, you know, 70 years ago. So I'm not, but my I'm not viewers, sure. I would say that my viewers, I'm guessing are in that camp where mm -hmm. we're used to knitting patterns that were written for one size and we have to adapt. Yes. Um, so there might be some adventurous 
people in my audience who would say, well, let me give it a try because yeah. maybe they are 32 inch busts. So they're not going to have any problem whatsoever. And if they're 34, 36, or even 38 inch, they may know like, well, I could probably add on to the chart uh -huh. and figure yeah. it out. Once you get familiar with the system, then maybe you can make those little adjustments. And that might actually be easier than making an adjustment to a vintage pattern because there really might be isn't a system. Every garment is completely a different ball game. Right. Yeah, they're definitely by somebody different. Yeah. She has a, a particular way and style of of doing her charts and her sweaters. And I've I've knit enough of them now that I I can apply information that I learned on, you know, one sweater to sleeve shaping or construction on another sweater. And I can see how one blanket inspired the corresponding sweater that was knit in the same style. Um, and like anything, yeah. the more you do it, the more you understand it, the better mm -hmm. you get. So yeah, if you're at the true. professional level, somebody starting out is going to have to go through the low levels to ascend. Yeah. Okay. As far as the individual patterns, I, I think I have got a couple of them up for sale. Um, I sold one once, maybe twice. Where can people find you on Ravelry? Um, my Ravelry name is my, because I'm a, I'm a graphic designer publisher. So when I started Ravelry, my, my username was document geek, because that's like my publishing handle but then and you can't change it I've asked the Ravelry people and they said no you can't change it we're sorry <laughs> and the one that I want is taken so on Ravelry I am document geek but I also have an Etsy shop and I have my own website called knit swag and so what I do for now because because I have my own YouTube channel that's you know it's knit swag. And so we talk every week or every other week about number knitting, and we're always doing a knit along. And for the knit along, I give the pattern away. It's like, it's, it's yours, take it. And they can win prizes. Um, and you know, our channel is small. And so the possibility of someone doing the knit along and winning a prize is, is great. very high, <laughs> probably higher than any other podcast. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so come join in it along for the people that do actually spend the, the $74.99 copy um, dollars on the digital version of this. If they want the charts for any of the charts that I've redrawn, which is all of them, if they want the charts, all they have to do is ask. And I'll just include like the new charts. The not the reason I don't distribute those just like blanket, like with every purchase, unless someone asked, is that I haven't tech edited them. Some of them, not all of them have been knit. And so I don't know, <laughs> but if they want a particular chart, I will give them the chart. And um, yeah, and they're, they're not all, cause it was kind of a process to figure out like how to draw the charts and like what program to use and what, like the style, like all the computer consistencies that I developed, like the workflow that took me quite a while to figure out um, that. So some of the charts are like in different file formats. And it's just like not super consistent throughout. That being said, if somebody buys the ebook, they want the charts, they just ask and I'll get them the charts that they want. Yeah. Um, and also because I know that I know that $74.99, like a lot of people are like, whoa, that's that's like a lot for an ebook. And I agree, but it's been a lot of work. And so, but I want people to have it. And I have I can afford $74.99 now as a, you know, a middle-aged adult, but I, there was a lot of time in my life where I couldn't afford $74.99. And so if someone wants to come and do a knit along with us and knit one of the patterns from the book, I'll give them a discount code of 50%. So like the more you knit with us, the more your discount code is. And so you can get the book at a reduced price. And I, I do that because this is not, this is not about the money for me. I want people to invest their, like their time and their energy and their heart into this, even if they don't have dollars to spend. Like I get that, I've been there. So the difference between your charts and the charts in the book, she's got a chart for every pattern, right? Every pattern. But you mm -hmm. have enhanced those charts to make them easier to read? I have, so like, this is a, a good example of one that's very difficult to read. It's all in one color. It's on the bias. There's like all these little bits and pieces down at the end. 
uh, the bottom of like how to assemble it. And so what I've done, uh, I've lightened up the the grid in the back and I've made the the like the actual chart itself easier to see, like there's a higher degree of contrast. All the 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 lines, because that's one of the things that she did, the, the lines on the chart in the in, within each unit, they determine the uh, orientation of the knitting, like the direction of the ridges. And so I made those like little wavy cyan lines just so they're easier to read. All these little squiggly symbols, which is like, you know, breaking the yarn and new yarn and all that. I colored those appropriately. So like everything about my new charts is like a thousand percent easier to read and easier to use. And that took a long time. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, if someone wants the ebook, I will include those for whichever charts that they they want. Well, that made oh. it that that made it easier to understand what you were mm -hmm. imparting. Yeah. More. I mean, are there things that are very different from what you've already shown? Because a lot of these have oh. similarities. They do. Lambs and butterflies. Okay. Patented. Yes. I'll this get is the one from the patent application. I'll so, get the patent and, and put it here so people can see. Okay. Yeah. So this blanket is awesome because it's knit um, concentrically, counterclockwise, mitered squares, and it's got pictures built into it, <laughs> which is wild. Like, I've never seen anyone knit mitered squares concentrically. She's the only one that I've ever seen do that. But then to also insert picture knitting into it, sort of like a quilt. I mean, that's like, that's wild. Mm -hmm. And I, I followed the chart. This is from the, her, um, the patent application. This, a picture of this blanket actually appears in the book, but the chart does not. It's only on the patent application that she filed in 45. And um, so this is like kind of the, the, thing that started it all was the the lambs and butterflies blanket i saw that patent so i know i'll be able to get it and put it here for people to have a good long look at awesome is there anything that you were expecting me to ask that i didn't i don't think so you're so multifaceted and you've done so much in this avenue. It's very easy for me to have overlooked something. Oh, the green and white triangle in the back. Let's oh. hear about people. Yeah, that's called, know. that's called the Tarzetto um, shawl. And I designed that and it's, oh, it's, it's not hers. That's not hers. Okay. That's mine. Because it doesn't have squares and triangles and so forth. Well, it sort of does. Yeah, so it's it starts with a, a divided triangle in the center and then you um you pick up on one side and you knit like trapezoids and then you pick up here and you knit you know more kind of trapezoids and then the same thing there and so it's it's uh it's i i after i designed this i found out that stephen west said something very similar but honestly mine is cooler <laughs> I think it's very interesting. It reminds me of a maze. Uh -huh. Like you happen to have all of your stripes run off the edge, but if you yes. close them in, you could make mm -hmm. half and go all the way around. Yeah. Start in the yeah. and come out at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very cool. When I was a kid, yeah. I used to love to play with stuff like that. Those would be my kinds of doodles because I didn't have a talent for drawing figures until I took drawing classes uh-huh geometry came easily to me because yeah I'm me too math, math nerd so mm -hmm. I was always interested in geometry and those were the kinds of things that I would doodle yeah that's what I They're would do Escher Escher like yeah I, I loved MC Escher that was I I struggled in college math class but then they I remember we had this thick book it was um it was problem solving class and then I, I remember flipping to the back of the book and there was this whole section on mc usher and i was like what is this magic mm -hmm. <laughs> and that was right around the time i discovered number knitting too so it all ties yeah. in 
Yeah, there is one other thing that I think you might be interested in. It's this little thing. I don't have, it's just a swatch, but it's it's the same idea as what Virginia did with the, the modular squares based, you know, one off of each other. Um, what I did is I knit um, a little bar in stock in it and then a reverse bar in reverse stock in it and then the next end of the square in stock in it. And so the cool thing about this is that it's, this is all one piece of yarn with only two yarn ends to it. So there's no breaks in this. This is modular knitting with variegated yarn and yarn pooling. And so I've, I've seen people do planned pooling to make like Argyle. And I've seen Don Barker came out with something called um, unplanned pooling planned. I forget what Don Barker's name is for her, her stuff. Um, but it's, it's the same idea in that you, when you get to the contrast color in the yarn, you knit a little bobble or, you know, a little, you do something, something. different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, but this one is the planned pooling, but it uses modular knitting. And so each one of these squares takes exactly one, you know, length of the skein of yarn. And so it makes like a basket weave pattern. And so my friend dyed this yarn and she had the one skein of yarn and she divided the one end of it into three bits, dunked one of them in pink, one in purple and one in blue. And all the rest of the skein was like a dark, like a navy blue. And so that's how you can get all these very specific colors, like independent of each other as like separate contrast colors all within one skein. So if you want to do something like this, but you don't want to have a gazillion yarn ends to weave in, which is like, who likes weaving in ends? This it is a really fun technique. It has to be technique. very precise. The it does. Dye. Yeah. If the dyer is off a little bit, it's going to throw your whole... Well, you can adjust because each one of these squares is modular. And so you start purling wherever you get to the blue. And so... There's a little bit of wiggle room. A little bit. Of wiggle room. A little bit. Just enough. Okay. <laughs> well, you so would have fun. the experience. So, <laughs> yeah. I know this is a labor of love for you, but you've invested so many years of your life. I, I have to take this opportunity to wish you all the success in the world. And I hope yeah. that despite my hesitation that there may be people who are more adventurous than I am who are willing to take the leap. Dr. Strong was wearing a very beautiful scarf that was, I believe, from the book. So yeah, for the people who want to try it, start with that. You'll see in the video what she's wearing and it drapes so beautifully around her neck. So maybe um, that would inspire some people to see because you've shown more like garments, but and you did show a couple of the things that twist and, and tie, but take a look at what Strawn is wearing because I think that's a whole other thing. Hey, well, Kelly, this has been a pleasure, a little bit um, challenging to wrap my head around, and I don't often say that, no. but <laughs> I salute you for having Thank the you. persistence to stay with this and keep... Uh, stretching the envelope yeah it's fun uh, thanks well, for having me okay it takes all kinds some people thanks. like chocolate <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for spending a little time with me today you're welcome see you, you on the interwebs sounds good maybe at Rhinebeck next year definitely <laughs>